All right, you guys, another differential geometry stream for everyone. Uh, before I kick things off, my goal is to read about four sections out of, if you don't already know, differential geometry, Dover edition. Um, but like I said, before I kick things off, what is my purpose for doing these streams anyways? But what I want to do with these streams is imagine if you're like a musician or you're a visual artist and you're a little kid and you're in school or you're, you know, being enculturated in whatever way. And if you're in the West, let's say that they hold back from you Beethoven symphonies or Bach or the Beatles or you're never exposed to certain kinds of music. Will you ever produce good music? Possibly, but I think it would be a real shame for a young kid who has the potential to grow up and become a musician and they never hear one of Beethoven's symphonies. That's kind of a shame. Similarly, if you're a visual artist, let's say, like you're destined to become a great painter and you know, you're in art class as a first grader, but all you ever do is just a stupid crayon drawing with the sun in the corner, stick figure guy, and a house that's a square with a triangle on top. And that's the limit of visual art that you're ever exposed to. You don't ever get to see a Cezanne. You never get to hear about pointillism or impressionism or none of that you don't ever see the Mona Lisa of course that kid could still grow up and become a good painter perhaps we don't know but like I said it is kind of a shame that that kid would never walk through a single art museum perhaps and nonetheless still be destined to be a great painter so if you take each of those examples by analogy and extend it to let's say a mathematician that's just how it is forever because the amount of work clearly that you need to put in to climb up the ladder in order to get to the so-called great mathematics the so-called you know big revolutionary scientific stuff and you want to read Maxwell's equations which uh, you know explain electromagnetism that is so ubiquitous in our day-to-day -day experience. People pull their phone out of their pocket and they're like, "Well, you know, science has to have you know some truth and stuff because we wouldn't be able to build this if we didn't understand electromagnetism with Maxwell's equations." But then you can point to the equations all day, but if you don't understand what it means, how are you going to put two and two together to build all the technology and stuff, right? So that's kind of what it's like to then grow up. And all you get taught in a math class is uh, how to read a multiplication table and order of operations, PEMDAS. Maybe you wrap your head around a little bit of algebra, maybe trigonometry, right? Yeah, right. Doubt it uh, for 99% of people because their attitude in those sorts of situations is, oh, when am I ever going to use this? Okay. Which is you know, to some extent true, when are you ever going to do a linear regression of a scatter plot of a bunch of points? And, you know, in your day to day life, the most math you really do is when you're trying to look for the lowest price of milk at the grocery store, basically. But I just want to say it's a real shame, then because people like Louis Leger Valet, who are out there who come up with these concepts of torsion and stuff and they lay out these systems of thinking in theories of curves and such and this is pulling from the amazon page for his work which i talked about in the previous stream but it says this work has been selected by scholars as being culturally important and is part of the knowledge base of civilization as we know it but this guy doesn't even have an english wikipedia page right I think that is a real shame. So going back to why I'm doing these differential geometry streams in the first place is to kind of like walk you through as a tour guide in the museum of the thing, the achievements of mathematics, because this is like the highest exertion of thought of people's individual human lives 
stacked up on top of each other. And it's kind of like walking through a really expensive art collection, in my opinion. So with that being said, we are now going to return to the reading. This is section 15, The Formulae of Frenet. And if you look these up, they will also be called the frenet serre equations. Uh, two names, the guy Serre, uh, S-E-R-R-E-T, um, him and Frenet both came up with these uh, equations, which are you'll see for torsion, the principal normal, and the binormal. But at the time that they wrote them, they didn't have all of this vector notation that we're explaining them with now, which is, it kind of begs the question, what did they write these about in order to have their names attributed to them in the first place? But anyways, the first derivatives, t dot, p dot, and b naught, that is to say the derivatives of the tangent vector, the principal normal, and the binormal in terms of arc length of the unit tangent vector t, the unit principal normal vector p of s, and the unit binormal vector b of s can be represented as a linear combination of these vectors t, p, and b. The corresponding formulae are called the formulae of Frenet. They are of fundamental importance in the theory of curves. Let us at first explain the reason for the existence of the formulae of this type. In three-dimensional space R3, four or more vectors are always linearly dependent. And there's a problem in the preliminaries, which is just if you have uh, a four by three matrix, which represents your system of equations, there's always going to be at least two of those that are going to be linearly dependent on each other by the number of rows exceeding the number of columns, which is equivalent to if you had the transpose and there were more columns than rows. Needless to say, this means that any vector in this space can always be represented as a linear combination of three linearly independent vectors. Now, since t, p, and b are linearly independent, any other vector can be represented as a linear combination of these three vectors, in particular, also the vectors t dot, p dot, and b dot, provided these vectors exist and are continuous functions of arc length s. We already know two of the three formulae of Frenet, that is t dot equal to kappa, which represents curvature, which is a scalar, times the vector p, which is the unit principal normal. And I talked about those in previous sections. You can go back to, I think it was two streams ago. Yeah, two streams ago. And B dot, which is the derivative of the unit binormal, is equal to the negative torsion, where torsion is a scalar, times P, the principal normal. We will now find an analogous representation of the vector P dot, differentiating now, these are not derivatives. P scalar product with P itself is equal to 1. We have P dot with the first derivative of P in terms of arc length is equal to 0. I actually had a question on the last video which explained why that is. And it's that when you take the derivative of the dot product, you use the product rule. And so implicitly here we have p dot with the first derivative of p plus p dot with the first derivative of p. So that's equal to 2 times p dot with the first derivative of p. And then on the right-hand side, 1 is just a constant. So the derivative with respect to any variable, whether it be arc length or if it's a you know, linear real variable, you could call it t then that just goes to zero, and so then you can cancel out the two in front of two times p dot with the first derivative, and so that's how you get the second part, which is p dot with the first derivative of p equal to zero. That's how you get that. Good question, by the way. Anyways, hence if the vector p dot is not the null vector, it is orthogonal to p, and consequently of the form p dot is equal to a scalar a times the vector t plus a scalar c times the vector b, where t and b are, of course, the tangent vector and the binormal vector. 
Scalar multiplication by vector t and vector b respectively yields that the scalar a is equal to the first derivative of the unit principal normal p dot product with the vector t and the scalar c is equal to the first derivative of the principal normal p in terms of s dot product with the binormal vector b since the scalar product of the binormal vector and t is equal to zero that is to say b dot t is equal to zero differentiating the relation the scalar product of vector p and vector t equal to zero we find again this is the product rule for the scalar product of two vectors we find that the first derivative of the unit principal normal p dot you could say scalar product with t plus the unit principal normal p scalar product with the first derivative of the tangent vector in terms of arc length t dot is equal to zero that is p dot scalar product with t is equal to negative p dot with the first derivative of the tangent t which is equal to the negative curvature times the vector p dot product with p which is equal to the negative curvature or the negative value of what the curvature is since the first derivative of t is equal to the curvature times the unit principal normal differentiating then the principal normal dot product with b equal to zero and using the oh yeah the equation for torsion so using the equation for torsion we obtain the first derivative of the unit principle in terms of arc length dot product with the binormal is equal to the negative dot product of the principal normal with the first derivative of the binormal which is equal to torsion so you get the the formula of Frenet which are the first derivatives of the tangent vector the principal normal and the binormal vectors all in terms of the underived tangent principal normal and binormal which can conveniently be represented in matrix notation where you have the product of this skew symmetric coefficient matrix multiplied by those vectors t p and b in a column vector you get as the result another column vector which is the first derivatives of t p and b respectively that's probably the easiest way to read that honestly i don't know formulae analogous to those of frenet also occur in the theory of surfaces and will be considered in section 45 i don't know what that is applications of the formulae of frenet are numerous including the following and this is going back to in the first example our beloved circular helix example which i did two streams ago and so i'm always going to call it the beloved circular helix a curve is called a general or cylindrical helix if its tangent makes a constant angle with a fixed line in space circular helices have this property uh, see the example which i did in the last stream from the results obtained in section 13, we see that the curvature and torsion of a circular helix are constant, and consequently, the ratio of these quantities is also constant. The latter property is characteristic for all helices, as follows from Theorem 15.1, which is due to a guy called Michel-Ange Lancre, who, uh, before I read this theorem, a uh, historical note is that this guy, French guy clearly by his name, Michel-Ange Lancre, just like... Our boy Louis Leger Valet, he was also an engineer for the French Corps de Chaussée et Ponts. Corps de Ponts et Chaussées, the French Department of Bridges and Roads. And uh, interestingly enough, this guy, Lancre, was one of 167 technical experts, which they called savants, who followed Napoleon around on his. Uh, uh, what do you call him? His campaigns throughout Europe. So that's where we get the phrase savant from, because savant, of course, means uh, like a knower or knowing. And it was first used for guys who were these engineers following Napoleon around while he's doing his European battles and stuff. Anyways. Theorem 15.1, a twisted curve of class R greater than or equal to 3, so a curve that has at least three times differentiability in its parametric representation, with non-vanishing curvature as a general helix if and only if, 
At all of its points, the ratio of its curvature and torsion is the same. That is, tau of s to kappa of s is equal to a constant. Now we're going to do a proof of that. Let a curve C be a general helix. That is, by definition, its unit tangent vector T makes a constant angle alpha sub zero such that the magnitude of alpha sub zero is bounded below by zero non-inclusive and above by pi over two inclusive. That is to say, alpha sub zero cannot be zero. It's positive, and at most it's going to be pi over two with a fixed direction in space determined, say, by a unit vector c, where c dot t is equal to the cosine of this scalar alpha sub zero, which is the constant angle we just defined. Differentiating this relation, we have the scalar product of c with the first derivative of t, the tangent vector, is equal to the curvature kappa, a scalar, times vector c, which is then itself a scalar product with the unit principle normal vector p is equal to zero. Since curvature is positive, we find that the dot product of c and p is equal to zero. That is, at any point of c, the principal normal to c is orthogonal to the vector c. Binding c at a point of capital C, it lies in the corresponding rectifying plane, which contains also the unit tangent vector t and the unit binormal vector b. Okay, this sec this proof is going to be a little bit tricky to read because there's the curve proper, which is capital C, and then we're constructing a unit vector, which is labeled lowercase c. So what just happened was a scalar product between the vector that's being constructed, lowercase c, scalar product with a unit principal normal is equal to zero. And then the vector being constructed, lowercase c, is then being bound at a point, a particular point of the curve capital C proper. So I'm going to read the sentence one more time because the lowercase vector c and the capital curve proper c, it's going to be confusing here. I can already tell. Since curvature is positive, we find that the scalar product of the vector we're constructing, lowercase c, with the unit principal normal p is equal to zero. That is, any point of the curve proper c, the principal normal to this curve proper, capital C, is orthogonal to the vector being constructed, lowercase c. Binding the lowercase vector being constructed c at a point of the curve proper c, capital C, it lies in the corresponding rectifying plane, which also contains the unit tangent vector t and the unit binormal vector b. I'm also just going to say that these formulae of Frenet, it constructs a trihedron, which makes it really convenient to assign a frame of reference when you're a point traveling along the curve. And so that's basically the logic that's going on here, is by binding the vector we're constructing, C that's going on here, to this point, then basically where by the uh, definitions of the tangent and binormal vector, conveniently in terms of the principal normal vector, you can uh, flatten, if you will, the plane that is spanned by T and B to just be like the ground. And so you're moving along the curve, but you could you could look at it as like pulling a corkscrew out of the ground instead of moving along the corkscrew itself. That's just basically what the proof is doing here, I guess. And it's hard to read with the lowercase c and the uppercase c. Okay. Formula 15.2, which is just that c dot t equals cosine of a sub zero, is therefore equivalent to vector c dot with vector b binormal equal to sine of a sub zero. And this is all illustrated into the figure 18 to the left. So we're going to differentiate now the dot product of the vector we're constructing C with the principal normal P and using the 
formulae of Frenet, we obtain C scalar product with the first derivative of the unit principal normal is equal to the vector C we're constructing being scalar product with the quantity negative curvature times the vector t plus torsion times the vector b closed quantity is equal to negative kappa that is curvature times the cosine of this angle here between the tangent and binormal vector alpha sub zero plus torsion tau times sine of alpha sub zero is equal to zero hence the ratio of tau of s over curvature kappa of s the ratio of torsion to curvature is equal to the cotangent of alpha sub zero which is equal to a constant all right second part of this proof conversely let us now assume that the ratio of curvature and torsion of the curve capital c proper is constant which is then spelled out here symbolically tau of s over kappa of s is equal to c sub zero a constant that's what we're going to call the ratio of torsion to curvature so since we have the ratio of torsion and curvature being a constant then we can rewrite this so that the ratio of torsion to curvature times curvature then subtract away torsion is equal to zero so again by the formulas of Frenet we obtain this relation which is the value of the ratio of torsion to curvature scalar multiplied by the vector which is the first derivative of the tangent plus the first derivative of the binormal vector is equal to the quantity the ratio of torsion to torsion to curvature times curvature minus torsion closed quantity times the principal normal p is equal to zero this is intense you guys to read out loud we integrate c sub zero times the vector t plus the vector b is equal to a new vector c star where c star is a non-zero vector but it is a constant so it denotes a constant vector in this case taking the scalar product of the unit tangent vector t to the curve proper capital c by the unit vector c which we just constructed which is equal to this new vector c star which is the transformation by the ratio of torsion to curvature normalize that by its own magnitude and you get the relation c sub zero times the tangent vector t plus the binormal vector b all over square root of the quantity one plus c sub zero itself squared we find that the vector c dot with t is equal to c sub zero over this square root of the quantity one plus c sub zero squared closed quantity is equal to a constant which is less than one which is convenient because of how in the very beginning this angle alpha sub zero was constrained to be less than or equal to pi over two hence the vectors c and t make a constant angle and the curve c proper is therefore a general helix because keep in mind this theorem here says a twisted curve of okay it's three times differentiable with non-vanishing curvature is a general helix if and only if so in this proof you have to prove two directions and that's what we just witnessed here part a where we go through and let a curve blah 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 we get okay now torsion to curvature is equal to a constant so you first assumed that you have this helix and then it's like i said by equivocating uh pushing a corkscrew into the ground versus actually traversing the corkscrew itself that's how you can basically equivocate the plane spanned by the unit tangent vector t unit binormal vector b that's what you fixed to the ground basically okay in the first part and then the second part of this proof then you go the other direction so you assume the ratio of torsion and curvature is constant how do you get from that now to knowing that you have a general circular helix that's what this proof was 
We have a nice little problem here. Problem 15.1, derive the formula of Frenet for the first derivative of the unit principal normal P from the other two formulae by proving that the matrix in the matrix representation of the formulae of Frenet must be skew symmetric. So we're going to show that this matrix here is skew symmetric. And I'm going to go straight to that page now instead of scrolling so we can save time. So problem 15.1. We set the tangent vector equal to a1, the principal vector, normal vector equal to a2, and the binormal vector equal to a3. And so the derivatives of a1, a2, and a3 in terms of arc length is equal to the sum from k equals 1 to 3 of coefficient c sub i sub k times the vector a sub k for i equals 1. 1, 2, and 3. And we can determine the coefficients c sub i sub k. So the vectors a sub k are, are orthogonal by showing that the dot product or the scalar product of a i dot with a p, a particular vector in this case, an arbitrary one of these a sub i, is equal to delta sub i sub p, which is equal to either 0 when i does not equal p, or 1 when i does equal p. If we differentiate this uh, expression for delta sub i sub, k, uh, sub p, excuse me, with respect to the arc length s, we obtain that the first derivative of a vector sub i dot product with vector a sub p is equal to negative of vector a sub i dot product with the first derivative of vector a sub p derivative with respect to s. On the other hand, if we take the scalar product of the sum relation of the derivatives of these vectors a sub i, so sum of k from 1 to 3 of c sub i sub k times the vector a sub k, and a sub p, so we're going to take the scalar product of a sub p and that sum there, then in consequence of this delta sub i sub p, we have that the first derivative of a sub i with respect to s dot product with a sub p is equal to c sub i sub p, the constant. Hence, in consequence of the aforementioned line, then we have that c sub i sub p is equal to negative c sub p sub i, which literally all that just happened was showing by a calculation that we have the definition of a skew symmetric matrix obtained. So at a matrix level, of course, yes, the transpose of matrix A is then equal to its negative, okay? But at an entry level, that's the key to this definition that that's what's being shown. So A is skew symmetric when A sub J sub I equals negative A sub I sub J, or you could obviously just do the negative of that and then you get exactly the same thing, which is what was shown here. From this and the Frenet formulae, then the first derivative of t in terms of arc length s is equal to the curvature times the principal normal p, and the first derivative of the unit binormal vector b is equal to the negative torsion tau times the principal normal p, and so we obtain that the first derivative of the principal normal p is equal to negative curvature times the vector t plus torsion times the vector b. Not so tricky to do, but it's a little tricky to read. <laughs> okay, section 16, motion of the trihedron and the vector of Darbu. As I mentioned in the last stream, there's a lot of French guys in here. Darbu, Lancre, Frenet, Serret, Fermat, Descartes. And now that I just said that, in Theorem 16.1, reading a little bit ahead, this guy, Giulio Mosi, he's actually Italian, so I contradict myself. But when a point moves along a curve, capital C proper, the corresponding trihedron makes a motion, which we will now investigate. 
uh, critically, I will say that this has to be a uh, rotating motion because if you have vanishing curvature, then it's kind of trivial. But not kind of, it is trivial. But this consideration turns out to be a kinematic interpretation of the formulae of Frenet, first made by Julio, uh, not Julio. I don't know what this guy Darbu's first name is off the top of my head. Did I open up his Wikipedia page? No. Sorry, bro. In 1887, since the vectors T, P, and B have always the same mutual position in the constant length 1, we may embed these vectors in a rigid body K, which performs the same motion as the trihedron. Our problem may consequently be considered as a problem of kinematics of rigid bodies. We start from the following fundamental. Okay, also, this is just saying that the center of mass then gets, uh, that's what's this whole kinematic interpretation of rigid body. It's about the center of mass of that rigid body. We start from the following fundamental. Theorem 16.1 due to Giulio Mosi and Augustin Cauchy. Any motion of a rigid body in space is at every instant an infinitesimal screw motion. I'm going to read two more paragraphs and then I'm going to go on a huge historical tangent. By definition, a screw motion is composed of a translation T along a straight line L and a rotation R about L such that the angle of rotation is proportional to the translation during corresponding times. The path of any point P of the moving body K, not on the axis, is therefore a circular helix. Theorem 16.1 was first communicated by Giulio Mosi in 1763, but... The earliest correct proof is due to Augustin Cauchy, who rediscovered the theorem. We exclude the translation of the moving trihedron from our investigation and consider only its rotation. Thus, we assume that the trihedron undergoes a translation and is then bound at a fixed point, say, at the origin of the Cartesian coordinate system in space. Okay, really, we need, we have, if you don't know who Augustin Cauchy is, you uh, pay attention now because he is super important in mathematics. This is like with the whole museum stuff that I was talking about in the beginning, the museum of mathematics, if you will. Okay. There would, there should be a hall that you walk down that starts off where you've got this I Augustin Cauchy on the outside. And you're going to be like, Oh, this guy Cauchy, he really contributed to math. We're about to find out what complex analysis is. And you go down this hall and you get to one of the crown jewels of mathematics. This is like one of the biggest deals, in my opinion, of all of math. And it's from this guy, Cauchy. Don't, don't think about the cauchy schwarz inequality, okay? Which is just bounding the inner product of no it's about complex variables and the crown jewel of mathematics is residue theorem okay not of it's not the crown jewel of mathematics entirely but it's it's one of them okay so if you are in i don't know algebra 2 or whatever it is and you're coming up with the solutions of polynomials, right? <clears throat> and you have quadratics, okay? So how many times does the parabola intersect with the x-axis? That's how many solutions you have. But what if you have a parabola where it's only touching the x-axis at only one point? Well, it's going to have them repeated, but anyways, this is just to say that you're going to have complex numbers, okay, because just because you only have one solution, it may be a real valued solution, okay, when it touches the x-axis, but that's just because there's an imaginary component, if you will, or an extension of the, there's a, a field of numbers beyond the real numbers it it's not necessarily imaginary okay because if you have alternating currents in electromagnetism okay you could say that the you're representing what's going on with an alternating electromagnetic current yes with complex variables that is to say square root of negative one stuff is going on but 
electromagnetic fields are real because if you touch it and stuff, you know, you're going to experience the shock. And so it's obviously something is real going on, but it's quote unquote, you're using imaginary numbers because the quantities don't correspond to uh, what we would call things from real life. So like uh, having money in the bank or not being in debt. Okay. So that's positive and negative numbers. If it's not that, it's not real is basically the interpretation. But from what I kind of just said in a loosey goosey way about alternating currents and electricity, well, electricity is real. If you fuck around, you might die. Okay. So it's real. So the term imaginary numbers is a little bit prerogative, but uh, you know, it gets a little bit confusing for some people because of that, because you can't wrap your head around why you would need to build up mathematics around numbers systems involving the square root of negative one it also goes beyond stuff that this one guy galois would say about um extending uh number systems as far as their algebraic properties because you could have uh, you know just uh rational quotients so integers divided by other integers but then if you slap on a uh, plus uh, coefficient times the square root of two, then you're going to have a lot more than just those quotients of rational numbers. Okay. But then you could do a uh, square root of a negative number, negative one, and uh, things get even more interesting. So Cauchy basically followed this kind of thinking all the way to to its very end, you could say, because when I'm talking about the highest exertion of thought of mathematics going into this, obviously me sitting here like a dumbass, like what kind of a chance do I have of if I were on a deserted island coming up with all of this stuff just by myself? N not a good chance. That gets us to why this residue theorem here is like a crown jewel of mathematics because the amount of thinking and like how could you possibly come up with this on your own okay without really sitting down and like devoting your life's work and time in order to figure this out what is residue theorem it's a it's a one-liner equation that's like an inch long it's a micro penis length of an equation okay so you have one over 2 pi times i, which is the square root of negative 1, right, times contour integral of a function f of z with respect to z, where z is a complex value. So it's real plus i times another real number. So you have a real component and an imaginary component to get a complex value. It's complex because it's real and imaginary combined, is equal to the sum k equals 1 to n of the residues of f of z about a point z equals a sub k. I'm going to draw a picture of this because this is just absolutely wild. Okay. So I don't even have to look at the Wikipedia page because I already know what this is. 2 pi i 1 over integral contour f of z this is an analytic function complex equal to k equals one sum three residue of z about a k of f of z did i get that right yeah you bet i did So what does this all mean, right? 1 over 2 pi i, that's uh, just a constant, so we're not going to worry about right now. But a contour integral, what the f*** is that, right? You might ask. Fair question. So we're doing this all on the complex plane. That was pretty sloppy, so I'm going to redraw that. So we've got real here, and then we have imaginary. And we have a function f that's defined at all points in this plane. So that is 
this is just the domain of f. And we have in complex variables what's called the unit circle. And so if you have that function f, you could evaluate it just on this circle, okay? And so at each one of these points, it would be a particular value, and that would be complex. If it were just real, let's say, you could be walking along this circle, and there are points that are like popping out with whatever the magnitude of the value of f of z is at that point. But it's beyond that because it's a complex variable function so you're going to get a complex variable out and so you can't just think about it in terms of walking along the circle and its values popping unless it were the magnitude is the actual uh you know corresponds to an actual point in complex space i guess but you know we're really getting far out at that point so just think of it as this is just the picture of the domain of the function f, okay? What this is saying is if you want the value of doing the integral of walking around this path, which is a closed circle here, and when you're taking the integral of f, you could get that. Well, first of all, Cauchy's integral theorem says that that's equivalent to the entire, uh, doing the integral over the entire plane. But we're getting ahead of ourselves. In order to get this uh, value of the integral of walking around this contour here, you do the, what's called the sum of the residues. Okay, what's a residue? This is where it's it blows my mind. Okay, f of z. You take this and you do a Taylor series expansion. Okay, I'm not going to write it out. Taylor series, but then you look at the second term coefficient of this. So you know how you have like first term is, you know, whatever over zero factorial plus whatever to the first power over one factorial. Okay, forget this. That doesn't count. X squared over two factorial. That's what I'm talking about when I'm saying this, the coefficient of your Taylor series expansion. The sec the coefficient on the second term of this Taylor series expansion of your function, your complex variable function, f of z, sum those up. Those are what the those coefficients are the residues. So oh my God. Right as I'm saying that, my camera died. That is how you compute the integral around this curve here. That gives you the by Cauchy's other theorem, the integral theorem, you can equate that integral around this closed curve for the entire plane. Could you imagine coming up with that by yourself on a deserted island? No, absolutely not. But that's like to connect those two things just the value of a coefficient from your Taylor series expansion gives you the integral in the entire complex plane if you really think about it. That is like all of complex analysis right there. Like that's basically, you could spend like a whole entire semester in college building up to that, rightfully so. And that's that's what I'm saying. It's It's a, you could have a whole wing of the Museum of Mathematics in your intellectual mind that is devoted to that. You know what I'm saying? That's just like crazy. Anyways, a rotation of a rigid body can be simply and uniquely described by a rotation vector. Definition 16.1, a vector D is called rotation vector of a rotation if it has the following properties. One, vector D has the direction of the axis of rotation. Two, the sense of D is such that the rotation has the clockwise sense if one looks from the initial point of D to its terminal point. The absolute value of D equals the angular velocity omega angular philosophy is that what i said angular velocity omega of the rotation that is the velocity of points at distance one from the axis of rotation 
let P be any point of a rotating body K and let Z be the distance of P from the axis of rotation. We denote by R the position vector of P referred to a coordinate system with origin on the axis of rotation. The derivative V equals R prime of R with respect to the time T is called the velocity vector of P. This vector has the direction of the motion of P and its absolute value V is the velocity of P. If alpha denotes the angle between the position vector R and its rotation vector D, if alpha denotes the angle between the position vector R and the rotation vector D, as we can see in the figure 19 to the left, then the magnitude of the vector V is equal to omega times Z, which is equal to omega times the magnitude of the vector R times the sine of angle alpha, which is equal to the magnitude of the cross product between the vector d and r. And in consequence of the definition of d, then we have that our velocity vector v is equal to the cross, the cross product of d and r. Okay, now my battery is really... We will now determine the rotation vector d of the trihedron, assuming that the curve proper capital C under consideration is of class r greater than or equal to 3, that is to say it is at least 3 times differentiable and has non-vanishing curvature kappa. The position vector of any point p of the above rigid body k connected with the trihedron is of the form r vector equal to scalar u times vector t plus scalar v times vector p plus scalar w times vector b. That is to say, this vector r can be represented as a linear combination of the tangent, the principal normal, and the binormal vectors. Assuming that the point moving along the curve capital C under consideration has constant velocity 1, we may equate the arc length S of C with the time t. The velocity vector of P thus is of the form V equals R dot, or the first derivative of R with respect to arc length, is equal to the linear combination of the first derivatives of t, p, and b each with respect to arc length, and the linear combination is given in terms of scalars u, v, and w, as follows from the Frenet formulas, the vectors t dot, p dot, and b dot lie in the same plane, which in a figure on the next page, I'm going to get this in here and maybe I'll try to cut it and put it on the screen somehow for you, is denoted by E. This plane is uniquely determined since we have positive curvature. According to the position vector with respect to a rotating trihedron, we're moving trihedron on a curve with non-trivial curvature, then the vector d is orthogonal to e, that is to t dot and p dot, and therefore has the direction of the vector t dot cross p dot, that is to say the cross product of the first derivatives each of the tangent vector and the principal normal. This cross product is equal to curvature times the principal normal cross product with the quantity negative curvature times the tangent plus torsion times the binormal closed quantity, which is equal to the square of curvature times the quantity of the cross product of the tangent and the principal normal, plus curvature times torsion times the quantity of the principal normal cross product with the binormal vector closed quantity, which that is then equal to curvature times quantity curvature times the vector binormal plus torsion times the vector tangent closed quantity. Hence, it is of the form d is equal to scalar c times quantity torsion times the vector tangent plus curvature times the vector binormal. In order to determine the constant c, we set v equal to w equal to 0 in the position and velocity vectors of the rotating trihedron. Then, in consequence of the form of this position vector, we have that the first derivative with respect to arc length of the tangent vector is equal to the cross product of d with the tangent vector. And by inserting what we just obtained as far as the representation of this vector d, we find 
that the first derivative of the tangent vector in terms of s, t dot, is equal to c times the quantity torsion times the tangent plus curvature times the binormal closed quantity cross product with the tangent vector is equal to c times the curvature times the principal normal vector. So comparing this with the formulas of Frenet, we have c equals 1, and thus finally the following results. Theorem 16.2, this is the vector of Darboux. The rotation vector of the trihedron of a curve, capital C, which is represented by the parametric vector x in terms of arc length s, which is of the class r greater than or equal to 3, that is to say it is at least 3 times differentiable with non-vanishing curvature, kappa is greater than 0, not equal to, then when a point moves along the curve capital C proper with constant velocity 1 it is given by the expression vector D of Darboux is equal to torsion times the tangent vector T plus curvature times the binormal vector B. Here vector D is called the vector of Darboux. There we go. If a curve C is plane, that is to say it is a curve, then D has the direction of the binormal. In this particular case, the binormal is the axis of rotation, and omega is equal to kappa, equal to curvature. In consequence of the equations for these position and velocity vectors for a moving trihedron, we can now write the formulae of Frenet in the form T dot is equal to D cross T, P dot is equal to D cross P, and b dot is equal to d cross p. And we arrive at another problem, problem 16.1. Determine the curves for which the corresponding vector of Darboux has constant direction in space. The answer is, obviously, the direction of the vector of Darboux d in space is constant if its derivative d dot is equal to tau times t... Oh man, I'm going to have to... If its derivative d dot is equal to tau dot times t plus tau times t dot plus kappa dot times b plus kappa times b dot, which is equal to tau dot times t plus kappa dot times b is proportional to d. That is, d dot and d are linearly dependent. d cross d dot is equal to quantity tau dot plus kappa b close quantity cross product with quantity tau dot t plus kappa dot times b close quantity which is equal to the quantity tau dot times kappa minus tau times kappa dot close quantity times the vector p is equal to zero and that is due to the linearly dependence of matrix only if they have full rank. Um, and formula 5.1, which is that the cross product of two vectors being zero implies that they're linearly independent. From this we have tau dot times kappa minus tau times kappa dot equals zero, or kappa squared times the derivative with respect to arc length of the ratio of tau to kappa is equal to zero. In consequence of theorem 15.1, which is the theorem of Lancre, a twisted curve of class r greater than or equal to 3 with non-vanishing curvature is a general helix if and only if at all of its points the ratio of its curvature and torsion is constant or is the same. By this theorem, we thus obtain the result that the vector of Darboux of a curve capital C proper at all points of capital C proper has the same direction in space if and only if C is a general helix. All right, moving right along, section 17, spherical images of a curve. We will now continue our investigation of the vectors of the moving trihedron of a curve, capital C proper, represented by its parametric vector representation, x, in terms of s arc length of class, r greater than or equal to 3. If you don't know what it is now, how did you make it to this point in the video? With non-vanishing curvature. We again assume that these vectors undergo a parallel displacement and become bound at the origin O of the Cartesian coordinate system in space. 
then the terminal points of these vectors, T of S, P of S, and B of S, lie on the unit sphere S with center O and generate, in general, three curves on S which are called the tangent indicatrix, the principal normal indicatrix, and the binormal indicatrix, respectively, of the curve C as shown in the figure below. The linear elements ds T, D, S, P, and D, S, B of these indicatrices, or spherical images, can be easily obtained by means of the formulas of Frenet, the formulae of Frenet. Since T of S, P of S, and B of S are the vector functions representing these curves, we find that D, S of T squared is equal to vector T dot, dot product with T dot, ds squared, which is equal to curvature squared times p dot with p ds squared, which is equal to kappa squared times ds squared. We have ds p squared equal to p dot dot product with p dot times ds squared, which is equal to the quantity okay, it's just expanding it out by the vector of Darbu is equal to quantity kappa squared plus tau squared ds squared. And finally, we have ds of b squared equal to b dot dot with b ds squared equal to tau squared times ds squared. I skipped over some of that, but that's just to say that these are the infinitesimal um, change of variables using the vector of Darbu to express uh, these infinitesimals of the tangent principle and binormal components of the moving trihedron, which is a convenient um, way of imposing a coordinate system on a point moving along a curve, which I guess this is another aside. I have the page open, but this has already been just like so all over the place because there's so much that could be said about a lot of this stuff. Uh, like I was thinking about maybe even just like going on a historical tangent about Maxwell's equations, but we don't even have time to go over that. Uh, I, oh yeah, I do have it open. It's on this page. I was trying to remember which one of these Wikipedia pages it mentions it on. Okay, so it's applications and interpretations of the formulae of Frenet or the Frenet-Serre formulas. We've got down here, in physics, the Frenet-Serre frame is useful when it is impossible or inconvenient to assign a natural coordinate system for a trajectory. Such is often the case, for instance, in relativity theory. Within this setting, Frenet Serre frames have been used to model the precession of a gyroscope in a gravitational well. Yeah, exactly. So if you forget gravitational well, but if you were walking along a corkscrew, a general helix, our beloved helix example, and you were holding a gyroscope, the formulas of Frenet would be extremely useful for describing the motion of that gyroscope. Let me just put it to you that way. And so, you know, these three equations that we have for the change of variables for infinitesimals in terms of tangent, principal normal, binormal, it allows you to do all of the calculus because surprise, kinematics, derivatives, Newton, right? It's like, you know, hopefully connecting the dots a little bit. I don't know. Probably not. Anyways. Curvature and torsion appear here as quotients of linear elements. Choosing the orientation of the spherical image induced by the orientation of the curve C proper, we have from these infinitesimal changes of variables that curvature is equal to the derivative uh, infinitesimal ds sub t, so the infinitesimal uh, of the tangent ds, and the magnitude of torsion is equal to the derivative ds sub b ds. I'm not sure how to properly read those. Curvature is equal to ds t ds, and 
magnitude of torsion is DSB DS. And this is a Leibniz notation as well. So again, I'm getting vibes of how, you know, you could go back in time with your quantum gravity time machine and your trolling Fermat and Descartes. You give Descartes the modern notation, wrong idea. You give Fermat the right modern idea, not a popular notation. Same exact thing with Newton and Leibniz. You give Newton the right idea, crap notation, except Newton's notation for derivatives is the dot notation here. So it makes it even more confusing reading this book, I imagine, because the derivatives in terms of arc length are using Newton's derivative notation, but then uh, primes is Leibniz, but more importantly, okay, I'm not I'm not sure if Leibniz used primes, but Leibniz for sure used D's, D's nuts. I'm just kidding. He used the whole like DS, DX, DY, DZ, uh, differential, a little differential infinitesimal incrementation. So reading these expressions for uh, curvature and torsion and the subscripts, because it's the arc length is subtended by tangent principle and binormal aspects. And then that's just all tossed into a soupy mess here of concepts, I guess. And trying to read it in a way that tries to do it justice. This is why math audiobooks don't exist, I guess, but my differential geometry streams do. Moreover, from these infinitesimal changes of variables, we obtain the equation of Lancre. ds sub p squared equals ds sub t squared plus ds sub b squared. So it's very Pythagorean. Since curvature and torsion are also known as first and second curvatures, the expression square root of the quantity ds t squared plus ds b squared closed quantity is sometimes called the third or total curvature of a curve, but I don't know if I'm ever going to say that. Different curves may have the same spherical image. We might as well just call that uh, Lancre curvature, maybe, instead of total curvature. I don't know, because we might as well just keep giving uh, French names to all this stuff. Different curves may have the same spherical images. Simple examples illustrating this fact are circles in the same plane, with arbitrary radius and center, and also circular helices, vector x of t equals r cosine t, r sine t, c t, so the representation of our beloved circular helix not in terms of arc length for a change, on coaxial cylinders for which the ratio r to c is the same, the radius to the uh, coefficient that uh, how fast are you going up the circular helix or down. Problem 17.1 and problem 17.2, and then we're at the last section. This is probably a long run. Probably not considered a speed run because this is going to be, what, like an hour and a half or something for four sections potentially? That's pretty long. And one sloppy tangent on uh, complex variables. Just to recap sort of where we are right now. Problem 17.1. Find the curves for which A, the tangent indicatrix, and B, the binormal indicatrix degenerates to a point. What does it mean when a spherical image is a closed curve? The tangent indicatrix is a point if the curve is a straight line. Who would have known? The binormal indicatrix is a point if the curve is a plane. A spherical image is a closed curve if the generating vector is a periodic function of the parameter. I was also originally thinking uh, if you had a ray that is going through the center of this sphere that you're projecting images of the curve onto, then if that um, curve crosses the ray at two times, then you might have one of those um, circles on the spherical image or like a, a closed loop, but 
The corresponding curve is not necessarily closed as can be seen, for instance, from a circular helix in the following problem. So I'm going to go back so I can read that problem. Investigate the spherical images of the circular helix, our beloved circular helix. We set w squared equal to r squared plus c squared, okay, just for ease of writing the uh, stuff going on here. We have expressions for the tangent, the principal, and binormal vectors for a circular helix. Tangent vector is equal to x dot, which is equal to negative r over w sine t, r over w cosine t, and c over w. We have the principal normal equal to radius of curvature rho times the second derivative x double dot, which is equal to w squared over r times x double dot for representation's sake, which is equal to negative cosine t, negative sine t, zero. The binormal vector is equal to the cross product of the tangent and the principal normal, which is equal to c over w sine t, negative c over w cosine t, and r over w. The spherical images are parallel circles. That's the investigation. The principal normal indicatrix lies in the x1, x2 plane. The other two images are small circles, which coincide if c equals r. All right, last section. And the reason why I'm reading all of these is because the next two sections... So I'll skip ahead to just read what they're called. We have contact and the osculating sphere. And then we have the natural equations of a curve. Each of these sections are about four to five pages a piece, making them the longest sections in this chapter, which is the entire like preliminary theory of curves, you could say. And so I don't know if you just saw with the quick flyby, but there's pretty heavy theorem and proof unraveling in section 19. So I wanted to at least finish with this section so that the next stream can start off with just going straight into the hard theorems and proofs. It's not that hard, but... I mean, okay, anyways, but shape of a curve in the neighborhood of any of its points, the canonical representation. In order to investigate the form of a curve, capital C proper, in a sufficiently small neighborhood of any of its points, we expand the vector function x of s by which capital C curve proper may be represented according to Taylor's formula. Assuming that the vector x of s is of class r greater than or equal to 3, we have that the vector x of s is equal to x at 0 plus the sum from v equals 1 to 3 of s to the power of v over v factorial times the v th derivative of x evaluated at 0 ds v plus Landau symbol O of S cubed, where the vector Landau O of S cubed has the meaning indicated in section 11. That is to say, very vaguely, that it vanishes on the order of S cubed. It's a bunch, it's all those terms of the Taylor formula going out to infinity. We say those higher uh, order of polynomials are going to vanish uh, on the order of s cubed. Or not polynomials, higher order derivatives. Since the point of capital C... I just had a Mitch McConnell moment. Since the point of C corresponding to s equals zero may be chosen arbitrarily, we may consider capital C in the neighborhood of this point without loss of generality. The vectors occurring in the Taylor formula expansion of the vector x in terms of s can be represented in terms of the vectors of the trihedron. We have x dot equals t, and according to the formulas or the formulae of Frenet, x double dot equals t dot equals curvature times p, 
x triple dot equals t double dot equals kappa dot times p plus kappa times p dot, which is equal to kappa dot times p minus kappa squared times vector t plus kappa times tau times vector b. We assume that the Cartesian coordinate system in space was chosen so that s equals 0 corresponds to the origin and the vectors t evaluated at 0, p evaluated at 0, and b evaluated at 0 lie in the positive rays of the x1, x2, and x3 axes respectively. Then, t of 0 is equal to the coordinate 1, 0, 0, p of 0 corresponds to the coordinate 0, 1, 0, and vector b evaluated at 0 corresponds to the coordinate 0, 0, 1 by means of these representations that we just derived, we obtain from the Taylor expansion of the vector x in terms of s, the so-called canonical representation of the curve capital C proper, wherein x sub 1 of s is equal to s minus kappa sub 0 squared over 3 factorial times s cubed plus little o of s cubed. We also have x sub 2 of s equals kappa sub 0 over 2 times s squared plus kappa sub 0 dot over 3 factorial times s cubed plus little o of s cubed. We also have x sub 3 of s equal to kappa sub 0 times tau sub 0 over 3 factorial times s cubed plus little o of s cubed, where kappa sub 0 and tau sub 0 respectively denote the value of the curvature and torsion at the point s equals 0. When we discard all the terms in each series except the leading term, we find that the vector x of s is approximately s kappa sub 0 over 2 s squared and kappa sub 0 tau sub 0 over 6 s cubed, where kappa sub 0 is positive non-zero and tau sub 0 is non-zero. By eliminating S from this relation, we obtain the following representations of the orthogonal projections of this approximate curve. In the osculating plane O, X2 is equal to kappa sub 0 over 2 times X1 squared, which is a quadratic parabola. In the rectifying plane R, X sub 3 is equal to kappa sub 0 tau sub 0 over 6 times x1 cubed, which is a cubical parabola, and in the normal plane n, x3 is also equal to the square root of 2 over 3 times tau sub 0 over the square root of k sub 0 times x2 cubed, which is a semi-cubical parabola. And these are shown on the next page. I'm going to flash it real quick for editing's sake, and we're going back. The graph of the approximate curve in space is shown in figure 23. This curve has a right-handed screw motion if tau sub 0, the torsion, is positive and a left-handed one if tau sub 0, the torsion, is negative. That means if the curve is traversed in the positive direction, it pierces the osculating plane at the point s equals 0 from the side of the negative or positive binormal according as the torsion at s equals 0 is positive or negative. While the curve has no singularity, its projection on the normal plane has a cusp. Problem 18.1, and this is where we're going to end it once I finish this problem. Let s, which is less than or equal to pi times r, be the length of an arc capital C proper of a circle of radius r with endpoints p sub 0 and p. The corresponding chord P sub 0 P has the length H equals 2R sine S over 2R equals S minus S cubed over 3 factorial times quantity 2R squared plus etc. If capital C is sufficiently small, then the difference, which is the magnitude of H minus S, is approximately given by the term 
s cubed over 3 factorial times the quantity 2r squared, that is, is of order s cubed. Prove that the difference of the lengths of a sufficiently small arc of any curve in the corresponding chord is always of order s cubed. Let C be any curve and X of S be its representation with respect to the coordinate system defined by assigning T, P, and B to correspond to positive rays of the coordinate axes specifying the system that these objects are in where S is the arc length of C. The points of C corresponding to the values 0 and S of the parameter determine a chord which has the length H equal to the square root of the sum of x sub i squared of s from i equals 1 to 3 from the canonical representation of the curve c we find that h squared is equal to and then we do some algebra which i'm not going to read we have s minus h equals kappa sub 0 squared over 24 times s cubed plus smaller order terms or the order on s is going to be higher but because of the whole landau symbol thing they're going to vanish that's it thanks for watching <laughs>